We do study the Bible in the life of our church, so you will need an outline. If you're new to us this morning, you may not be used to that. Just kind of enjoy it. We come to the Word of God, and we look at the hope of heaven, things that angels long to see. You know, the story of Christmas is a beautiful and diverse story. The story of Christmas has people that are very powerful and influential in it. We look at the story of Herod and all that Herod was as the ruler um, of the little nation of Israel in Jesus's, at the time of Jesus' coming. We look at the wise men who would come within the first two years of the Christ child's birth. Um, they were wealthy magi from the east. That means that they were not from Israel. In fact, if you think about it with me, these are the first non-Jews who would come and worship Jesus, and it, as the Messiah would be born through the nation of God's people Israel, bringing salvation to all nations, even in his birth, God had directed and brought non-Jews to worship him. And so the gospel is for everyone. We see that around the birth of Jesus. And so there's, there's not only kings and wise men, but we also see there's paupers. We see that there's there's shepherds that don't have very much. In fact, there is a young woman and a young man who are about to have a baby, and there's very mysterious circumstances around it that they don't fully yet understand, and certainly the people around them don't understand. But listen to this. There's not even a place for them to sleep on the night that he would be born. And so even the hymn that we have just sung, this new song, that we've just sung, Prepare Him Room, we see that there's so much beauty in the grand story of Christmas. And so this morning, and as we come to this season uh, of rejoicing in this truth, I just pray that we would allow the re realities of Christmas, the realities of the incarnation to pour over us, perhaps in a new way. Um, the meaning of Advent um, and we've kind of mentioned this, but take your outline, get a pen, and notice this with me. The word advent or adventus means coming. It's the anticipation of an arrival. It's the coming one. And it's not just the advent and the coming of the pregnancy of Mary. There's some people, when I was a kid and I would hear about this, I would kind of think, oh, you mean, you know, we're waiting nine months for the baby to be born. Um, we can really relate to that right now with Pastor Lucas and Indy, wherever they are, they're somewhere over here, but we're waiting on this precious little boy to be born to, uh, to Pastor Lucas and Indy. This is an exciting thing. We have others that are, that are expecting right now, and, but you see, this waiting goes far beyond the nine months, the gestational period between the Holy Spirit's conception in Mary and the birth of Jesus. You see, there's, there's another waiting that goes far beyond that. It goes way back to the promises of Abraham. It goes way back to the promises that God was making to his people that he would not only bless them, but that he would bless all peoples through them. And even in their, in their ups and their downs, through the times of not only the uh, the prophets that would be teaching in the kings, but and then we come to this beautiful time of prophecy um, where the final time of waiting on the coming Messiah would be proclaimed. And so there's a, there's a beautiful advent, this, this, this anticipation of the Messiah coming. Notice and fill this in. The observance of advent helps Christians worshipfully approach Christmas. The observance of Advent helps Christians worshipfully approach Christmas. Now, we need this because the society's gone crazy about Christmas, right? Um, the, there's, there's much that is, and, 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 and in such a way that the real meaning of Christmas has been lost. And so this is ultra important for Christians who are who are believers of God's truth and the believers of God's salvation, that we not let the true meaning of Christmas get lost on us. And so this is a, an important obser observance for us, not just as a church on Sunday mornings. Um, we do notice here the four Sundays prior to Christmas Day recognize hope, peace, joy, and love. We set those words aside 
to really look at them, as we'll do this morning on hope, circle the word hope there um, on your outline. That's the one we're going to look at this morning because this Sunday is devoted to the remembrance of God's promises, his hope for us. Now, it's not only on Sundays that we should do this. In fact, we have some great resources that are here, and they're in the bookstore, that are, that are all kinds of resources for every age group and for families to observe Advent together, for you to spend the next month having some time in the evenings, or perhaps it would be early in the mornings, but most, most families typically would do it in the evenings, perhaps at dinner or after dinner or before bedtime, where we remember the true meaning of this anticipated time of Christ coming and dying on the cross, uh, being born to die on the cross for our sins. And so this is the beautiful picture of that. This morning, I want to come to a passage of Scripture that helps us look at the hope that God would give us. It's from 1 Peter. Now, what's interesting about this passage for a Christmas passage is that it is way outside the norm. Most of the time when we come to Christmas passages, they are taken from what books of the Bible? Okay, somebody said it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke that have the story of the birth of Christ. The book of John does not record the story of the book of Christ, even though that's one of the Gospels, Um, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the events around the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus the Christ, who would die for his people, and save them from their sins. So we see that. But there's some other passages in the Old Testament that we will often look at. We will often look at the prophetic passages that declare hundreds of years before Jesus would be born in in Bethlehem that he indeed was coming. These are the prophetic passages that we look at very often. And so very often Christmas messages are either the prophetic passages from um, the prophets of the Old Testament or the Gospels. But this morning we come to a passage that that really captures this picture of the hope of Christ in a most unlikely way. Notice the setting of Peter's first letter. We're going to look at verses 1, 10, 11, and 12, but notice the setting of this. First of all, fill this in. This is written, we believe, right around 64 AD, and there's some reasons that we can nail it down because of some things that happened in Roman history, things that happened around the time of this, but we believe in 64 AD. This is 30 years after the church was really launched and really going. This is 30 years after Christ died, rose again, and ascended to heaven. So the church has been going for 30 years. Some things have been going great. Some things have been very hard. There's been a a steady amount of persecution during this 30 years. But nevertheless, the church has been exploding all across the Mediterranean world. And Peter is one of the leaders of that church. Notice this. This is in 64 AD. This is just prior to Emperor Nero's great persecution of the Christians in the city of Rome. In fact, the city of Rome burned, and he blamed it on the Christians. He said the Christians did it. And there was a a tremendous time of great difficulty. In fact, Nero was so insane in his persecution, um, he and a few of the other emperors would would torture Christians, um, torture Christians, sometimes even causing them to be lit on fire and, and ride his chariot through his garden with burning Christians lighting the way. That literally is recorded in some of the secular historians, not even Christian historians, but secular historians, as there was a great persecution of Christians. Notice the third bullet point here. First Peter, though, brings hope and encouragement amidst fiery trials. And this is where we begin. There's even the phrase, fiery trials among you, the difficulties among you. All of the persecutions and the hardships and the sicknesses and the poverty and the things that broken relationships because of your faith in Christ. And so this is where we can start to step in a little bit today and understand this. Do you know that there are Christians today around the world that are being persecuted? There are Christians this week who have been killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. We have friends in North Africa and the Middle East, just from our work of being overseas, that have great pressure upon them 
They do not live in an open society that has a guarantee of a freedom of religion. But yet they have discovered the gospel. They've been transformed by the gospel. They rejoice in the gospel, even in the midst of living in a constant pressure cooker of a culture that is against faith in Jesus Christ. And so this is not just 2,000 years ago in 64 AD that this would apply, but this is in 2018. And it's not just in the Middle East, and North Africa, and India, and in China. There are people in this room this week who have experienced great difficulties in their life. Some of them even because of their faith. There are some who go home to great difficulties. When they leave church today, they will go home to the great difficulties of their home where their own faith is not accepted, and in fact, it is mocked. And we need to remember that as God deals with us in his word, it is not just in the setting that was then, but God's word is for all people at all times in the setting that is here and now. Notice with me on your outline, you remember last Sunday we looked at this picture, we heard a message about the true Christian's true identity. If you're truly a Christian, what does the Bible say about who you are? And we found some great encouragement. Many of you have expressed that you were greatly encouraged by being reminded again of what all God has done for you. The fact that the three key words that I've underlined them here, that in Christ, in Christ, true Christians, read them out loud together, are accepted, they are secure and significant. Accepted, secure, and significant. This is what God's Word says, that you've been accepted by Christ. What more does it matter who would or would not accept you when the one who rules heaven and earth has accepted you? Secure. He says that no one can take us out of his hands. He says that what I have sealed for the day of redemption, no one can steal away. No one in their lo- can be lost from his great, beautiful protection and salvation. Insignificant. Our life has meaning in Christ. We're not just going to live our 70, 80, 90, for fortunate 100 years and then die having not lived a life of meaning, but because of Christ and because the Creator has saved you and given you a task to do in this life, your life is significant and your life matters. This is the beautiful promise throughout God's Word. There's an outline of Peter that helps us see the message even from last week that that we see this is a recurring theme throughout the Bible, and I pray that this really ministers to you. I pray this encourages you that even as we look at this little letter of 1 Peter, notice this, that the same themes from last Sunday show up again. In 1 Peter, in chapter 1, 1 through the first 12 verses that are there, notice what it says. This is covering the believer's security from being in Christ. We have a security when we are in Christ. It's similar to what we saw last week. In the next section of Peter, in verses 1, 13 through 2, 10, we see the believer's encouragement from being in Christ. We can be encouraged. Remember, this is being written to people who are already in persecution and about to go through a whole lot more persecution. You, some of you will find First Peter to be incredibly encouraging to you even this afternoon. Look at number three. In the middle part of the book, the lion's share of the book, we see um, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, 11. It's this, the believer's fellowship from being in Christ. We have a fellowship one with another, and we have a fellowship with Christ. We have a fellowship that helps us make it through the difficulties of this life, whether it be persecution or whether it be other types of hardship and trial. And then number four, I love this, the believer's steadfastness amidst suffering for Christ. And we see that as the last part of Peter, that we can be steadfast. He makes us steadfast in him. Indeed, There are many, many Christians throughout the last 2,000 years that have found the words of Peter to be life for them in their walk with God. In fact, as a missionary in a part of the world um, where there was a great persecution um, very often upon our people, our discipleship would very often begin in 1 and 2 Peter. 
we would read First and Second Peter right away with them once they became Christians because we knew that they were about to go through great pressure. We, we live in a land where we don't really experience that on a widespread basis, but many, many people, many Christians do live in that environment. And so 1 Peter is a great encouragement. I want us to see the verses here and see the hope that Peter is talking about, saying to us and saying to the people of the first century that there is a hope, there is a salvation that has been talked about from long ago. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 through 11. Concerning this salvation, so he'd been speaking of the salvation that is coming in Christ, that has come in Christ. Look what he says. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. You see, they were, they were searching, inquiring about this hope. Verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. You see, they were looking. They were waiting. The people were waiting upon this Messiah who had been prophesied to come. Look at verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So this hope that is promised, this salvation that was promised, this Messiah who was promised, the the circumstances around this and the impact of what is going to happen because he comes is so great and so glorious that even the angels in heaven, they cannot, they cannot wait to see it. They are waiting. They are, they are rejoicing. In fact, they even long to understand more about it. There is this picture that we're, we're talking about a, a grand and glorious salvation that God has promised that men and women boys and girls from every people and every tribe and every tongue will be saved because of this promise that God has made. And so I, I, I just, as we, as we come to the hope and the look and the wait for Christmas, we can be encouraged that it is a grand and glorious salvation. Notice this, and I want us to work through this. Notice these next bullet points that are below this that says what the prophets and the angels long to see. We see this in verses 10, 11, and 12, and so these points come from the passage. We want to be careful to see what the passage says. And so the first thing, the first point that is there is the Old Testament prophets had told of the coming grace of God in the Messiah. They had zeroed in. They had said, a Messiah is coming through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They prophesied. They foretold. They promised on God's, through, through God's leading, that a Messiah was coming. This was God's promise to his people, and it was going to be his grace that was going to come. Now, we also know that they had also predicted and they had also prophesied. They declared that there would be wrath for sin, but not only with that wrath, wrath of rebellion against God, that there would also be the grace of God's Messiah coming to his people. And you see that in verse 10. And it says that who prophesied about the grace that was yours to be searched. And I've highlighted that on the screen in front of you. This is the grace that was being proclaimed. Look at the next part there, the second bullet point. We also see this in verse 10. It's, this is the unfolding plan of God's salvation. And it was eagerly anticipated and it was being sought out after. They were really looking for it. We also see this in verse 10. Look at verse 10. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, they searched and they inquired carefully. And so God's people look toward God's promises, and they look for the fulfillment of God's promises. And you, if you're one of God's people, you should be looking, as they did, for the fulfillment of God's promises, not only in your life, but also in the future that we have before us, that we would be God's people remembering his promises and eagerly looking forward to them. Look at the third bullet point that's here. 
God's salvation would come through the sufferings of Christ. And so here we begin to see the nature of this beautiful promise. And, and we see this throughout the prophets. We see that, that God had promised that his salvation would come as a result of great suffering. Look at verse 11. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted, look what it says, the sufferings of Christ. You see, God's salvation would come through his Messiah suffering the judgment and the wrath of God on our behalf so that our sins can be forgiven. That is the picture and the meaning of his suffering. And not only that his sufferings would come in verse 11, but at the end of verse 11, you see that we also, these sufferings lead to the coming glory. This is the coming glory that God's salvation brings to his people, the forgiveness of their sins and the restoration into right relationship with him, and not only to us individually, but to all of creation. If you really read the whole picture of both the, the predictions and the prophecy of the Old Testament to even the, fulfilling, the fulfilled plan of God in the New Testament, that Christ is going to make all things new. This is glorious. And he will reign, as we've just sung, he will reign gloriously. Now, Isaiah 53 is where we see um, some of this, and I, and I want you to notice these, that the prophet's message was fulfilled and the salvation of God had arrived. This we see in verse 12. Look what it says in verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. He's saying people came and they preached to you the gospel. The, the people who were reading Peter's letter, they had become Christians and here they were in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their persecution, that Peter is saying to them, people came and proclaimed to you the gospel. You received the gospel and this gospel has been fulfilled in you. And this is a, the glorious nature of God's salvation being opened to you. And so there's two great hopes that are, that are anticipated here. First of all, there was the hope of Christ's first coming. Circle the word first there. Christ's first coming to save us through his suffering. Um, last Wednesday night, we read Isaiah 52 and 50, or portions of Isaiah 52 and verse 53, in chapter 53, that describe the prophecy that this Messiah is going to suffer for our sins. This Messiah is going to come and heal us spiritually. This Messiah is going to come and save us through his suffering. But not only his first coming to save us through suffering, but notice this, Christ's second coming which we anticipate now, coming to restore through victory. So the first time he comes on a little donkey into Jerusalem, coming to lay down his life, the second time that he comes, he will come on a great white horse, bringing in the victory and the glory of God, not as a humble servant, but as a reigning king. And so we see that God makes promises to his people. He's already delivered the first part, and he has promised the second part. We as Christians in our present day and time can rejoice in what he's done and look forward to what he's going to do. Notice the last point that is here. Salvation and the, glory, and the coming glory are so great that even the angels long to see it. They long to look into it. Now, there's a difference between human beings and angels. Um, we um, are, are just a very, very special creation. Obviously, angels are too. They have certain privileges and powers that, that God has given them to have. And we notice around the Christmas story, around the coming of the advent of Christ, we, we see it all through the Old Testament, but especially around this time, we see a lot of activity in the angelic realm. We see an angel come to Mary. We see God dealing with Joseph. We see other people that are being told that the Messiah is coming. He's coming now. We see the, the beautiful picture of the shepherds minding their own business out in the, out in the, the sleepy hillside outside of Bethlehem. And an angel shows up 
and rips through the night sky, the darkness, and declares to them that a Savior has been born, and he tells them how they can go find him. And then it says, right after that, that one angel making this declaration was, was joined by a host of angels. Now, I don't know what that means, but it was enough that they were sore afraid, um, as the King James puts it. They were greatly terrified by what they saw. So these angels have this ability by God's bidding and by God's design to be able to come and declare what he does. There's different types of angels, the seraphim angels that are, are always described in the, in the direct presence of God. Seraph means fire. Um, so there are these fiery creatures that are fierce and awesome, and they declare the holiness of God continually. They go and they do his bidding in his presence. And then there's others that are there. So we see in the heavenly realm that they are given some great privileges and some great tasks, but here's something beautiful. that There's, there's an indication here in, in the way this is said that the angels... They long to see and they long to be involved in what we get to experience. That, that they long to see and they long to see the fulfillment of God's promises even though they are behind the scenes working and carrying out his work. And so this is a grand promise and this is a grand privilege. So fill this in at the bottom. This brings true Christians, this, this promise, this prophecy that is here from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 through 12 that's described, um, this brings true Christians great hope amidst these present struggles. I want you to know that whatever you're dealing with in your life, whether it's overt persecution or whether it's great struggle physically, or whether it's great struggle emotionally, or financially, or any number of things that brings great difficulty to you. I want you to know that God's people have always struggled. God's people have always had pressure upon them. God's people have always had to navigate through this fallen world, but not alone, but with the promises that God has made, that when we look to him and we trust to him, first and foremost in Christ, but secondly, with each day that we have in life, that God delivers on his promises. Now, this is the picture of the gospel, and as we come to um, Christmas, as we come to uh, this time, I, I want to encourage us to really savor the goodness and the sweetness of, of Christmas. I don't want you to miss the beauty of what God has done in coming in the Christ child. Um, I know that there's lots of parties. I know that there's lots of busyness. I know that there's guests that are coming and going. I know that there's a lot of things that happen. And Christians can, can be tempted to let their, their eyes kind of glaze over when they come to worship at this time of the year. Um, I hate to say this, but um, you know, I've started, um, after my shoulder surgery, I've started working out again because I noticed that you know, I started gaining weight again as soon as I stopped working out. So, um, and then I read this depressing article that says the average American will gain six pounds in December. Now we do eat a lot more sugar and we eat a lot more carbs and we sit around and we enjoy one another a little bit more and there's, there's room for feasting, I believe. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. But we need, to, we need to recognize that there's still a beauty of worship that we should pursue, very much so because of the tremendous importance of what we see God doing when we celebrate this time of year each year. So take the time to savor the richness of Christmas. It won't happen automatically. You will have to take some steps to do that, and I want to give you a couple of sets of these right now. Number one, I want to encourage you to, number one, reflect on the people around the manger. And you can put out there to the side the, the events of Christmas, the events, excuse me, the events of the birth of Christ. Notice the life of Joseph. Notice the life of Mary, 
Notice the life, the lives of the shepherds in their poverty. And notice the lives of the wise men in their searching and waiting in the midst of their wealth and, in fact, not even being um, part of the nation of Israel. You see, we should remember the different characters of the Christmas story that are around the manger. There's, there's great encouragement that can come from considering the different circumstances that each one of them find themselves in in the midst of this. Look at number two. We would do well to remember the prophets before the manger. We would do well to remember the things that they said. And in fact, I've outlined a few of the passages. These are not all of them. In fact, some of your, some of your, you, you have books at home or some of you have study Bibles at home that would give an expansion of these. But Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 11, Micah 5, um, Jeremiah 31, Hosea 11, Zechariah, Daniel. We see these prophecies concerning the Messiah. And there's, there's many, many more. Isaiah 9. Um, would be part of that. And there's there's many more that we could list. But remember the promises because it's important that we see that God makes promises and then he keeps them. That's important for your life now because there's going to become difficulty if you're not already in it now. There will be difficulty that you need to remember his promises. You need to remember what he said in the midst of those hardships. There's a third thing that we need to watch out for if we're going to savor the richness of Christmas. You need to not only remember the prophets before the manger, but you need to watch out for the prophets around the manger. It's a different kind of prophet. Do you see that? One is talking about those who prophesy. The other one is talking about those who are seeking to commercialize and profit off of this Christmas season. You see, in the first Christmas, it had the danger of Herod seeking to kill the newborn king. But in our current day, the true meaning of Christmas can be stolen by the selfishness and the commercialization of our culture. We can miss the big picture of Christmas. You know, when I think about this, I, and, I, and I think about the idea of turning Christmas to be all about you and all about what you would receive, and we, we talk about this every Christmas because It's so important if true Christians, if God's people are going to resist the culture and not let them swamp the great meaning and the great truths of of Christian events and Christian doctrines, notice the juxtaposition of Christ's selfless love versus culture's selfish gain. Christ's selfless love versus the culture's selfish gain. You see, it's a, it's a dangerous thing with your children to make the most exciting thing about Christmas, waking up and running out to see what's under the tree for them. You say, oh, come on, Pastor, you're killing Christmas. Is that what you're No, not, not the goal to kill Christmas at all. But the picture is this. We need to remember the true meaning of Christmas, and we need to very carefully teach that to our children. And we need to speak that to ourselves as we remember what God has truly done um, through the events of the incarnation of Jesus. Christ leaves the halls of heaven. Philippians chapter 2 tells us in humility he comes, not regarding equality with God, something to be held on to, but in humility, in selflessness, he comes not only to join us on the earth, but then to die, even death on a cross. You see, this is a selfless love. He's showing us the meaning of selfless, selfless love. We must be careful not to allow that great truth and doctrine to be swamped by Satan and our culture in not only our own hearts, but the hearts of our children. Do you see what I'm saying? We need to be very careful with this. So be aware of the prophets around Christmas. Keep the true story before you and allow your worship to remain intact. Notice number four. We need to enjoy the glorious promises around the manger. We need to enjoy the glorious promises around the manger. So reflect on the people, remember the prophets, watch out for the prophets, and 
enjoy the glorious promises. And this is what it says in 1 Peter 1, 2. We've just talked about the fact that these promises are so great that even the angels long to understand, long to participate, long to see it be fulfilled. In all of what they do experience, they still long for this that is being fulfilled at the incarnation of Christ. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is just mainly on your on your outline, there, there is a portion that will show up on the screen, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. It says in verse 6, yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. You see, the culture is passing away, and all of the things of this worldly life that are, that are in this fallen world that are not redeemed by Christ, all of that is passing away. Look at verse 7. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, and then look at what it says, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Underline that last part there, what God has prepared for those who love him. Here's the picture. You can't even imagine how great the glory and the promises and the rewards are for those who love God. You, you, it has not entered into your mind. You're incapable of truly seeing and even being able to imagine the glory that is to come for those who enjoy the salvation of God. So this salvation that was, that was prophesied to the Old Testament people and this salvation that was gradually unfolding through the plan of God and then the coming Messiah and to us now as we look back on what he has done, this is all leading to something that goes far beyond Macy's and Mercedes. This is leading far beyond anything and everything that this world has to offer. It is going to blow it all away. And so we need to remember, we need to be very careful to stay in touch with what God has said and stay in His Spirit as we come into the Christmas season rejoicing in His great promises. So, how to remember the big picture of the gospel this Christmas? I want to encourage you to do that, to remember the big picture of the gospel this Christmas. Hold on to it with everything you have. How can you do that? Here are some practical things that you can do. Number one, be disciplined and be principled and be disciplined as you come into Christmas. I want to encourage you with that. Those two things, that, that you remember principally holding on to the gospel of Christ and that you hold on in discipline with that. That means denial of the urge right now to, you know, whatever. I mean, discipline is, is foregoing either uh, comfort or foregoing something now um, for a reward that is later. Sometimes we need to be um, really thinking about the fact that I want to be very principled as my family celebrates and goes through December. The second one, be purposeful and thoughtful. Um, you know, the, the culture just says, well, if it feels good, do it. If you feel the impulse, go for it. Um, in fact, some of the most profitable, we have some people who do um, uh, have stores um, and they're managers of stores here. Um, you know all those end caps that are right by the register and the end caps that are at the end of the aisles? All of that is, is typically very strategically placed. And, and it's the kind of thing that it's just putting out there, here, 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 here. And it's going with the impulse buy, right? Profit margin seems to be pretty good on those things. And so the, it's part of it. We need to be purposeful and we need to be thoughtful, not just about those things, but about who we are and what we do and what we say and who we spend our time with and, and all, that we're, all that we're seeking to do, what you do with your time over these coming days. How about this one? Set limits. I said this a few years ago and some people said to me, Pastor, that was really helpful to me. I had not thought about setting limits on some things as we came into this abnormal time of year. Set limits on spending. Set limits on eating. Set limits on drinking. Set limits on entertainment. 
I want to encourage you. If, if not, you'll, you'll look back and December will be a blur. And there may even be some big regrets that are in it. And so we as people, this is part of the other two that are there of being principled, disciplined, purposeful, and thoughtful. Being wise enough to set limits is good. How about this? Give the gospel sacrificially to the world. We need to give the gospel away. And not because it doesn't cost us anything, but sometimes because it costs us much. Maybe it costs us much time. Maybe it costs us much um, of, of our own desires that we are sacrificing for the benefit of others. You see, this is personally through love and through words or deeds. What about financially? As we take the international missions offering in December, we set aside not only this week for prayer, but we set aside this, this month to really look toward a special gift over and above our offering um, of the year in order to keep our missionaries proclaiming that a Christ child was born. And he was not only born, but he died on the cross and rose again that we can be saved from our sins. So this is a time for us to give the gospel away. There's a, there's a, a tremendous openness that our people have around us to talk about things religious, to talk about things spiritual, to even come to church at this time of year. We should be giving the gospel away. We should be making use um, of this opportunity that we have at Christmas. How about this one? Uh, the praise team and Pastor Lucas has encouraged us already with this, to worship thoughtfully at home and with our church to worship thoughtfully. That's, that's part of why we provide books like these that are here. And in fact, I mean, here's for a dollar, you can, you can have 30 of the main hymns of Christmas in this little thing. And they have hundreds of these over there. You, you can even buy a bunch of them and take them home and have one for each member of the family and be able to worship together at home. You say, well, pastor, if we sang, all the windows would break at our house, the dog would run for cover. Well, I, that's not true. You can sing together, and you can sing even a cappella. You, you, you know the tunes um, that are there. It's a great thing for you to do as a family. Christmas is a great time to maybe even start some of that tradition of singing as a family because um, this is a time um, of much singing and, and with songs that we often know um, very easily. But these are, these are just great. I mean, you can, you can teach your children to sing together and then, or maybe even just to look through the great lyrics that are written about the truths of Christmas. As we were praying and planning for this worship service, um, Pastor Lucas mentioned that Hark the Herald Angels Sing is one of the most robust theological carols that we sing at Christmas time talking about the incarnation. If you will notice the words we're singing, it's talking about the grand and glorious thing that God has done in coming to this world, becoming a man, and giving his life that we might live. And so this beautiful time of worship thoughtfully at home and with, with uh, your family. How about the last one that is here? Consider and discuss the true events the true events and significance of Christ's birth. Yes, I, I know that we have a lot of fun folklore and a lot of fun tales, fairy tales, that we experience at Christmas time, and we talk about those and we have fun with those. But our, our real discussions and our real teaching, our real remembrance, our real discipleship of our children should be around the true events I would hope and pray that your children know very well the story of Mary um, having a visit from the angel and that God was making a promise to her. And at first, she, she couldn't understand, but over time that God would bring her to understand. And that Joseph, faced with a great dilemma, Joseph, faced with great pressure, would come to see that God was going to provide and that God was going to take care of them. And that even after the Christ child was born, that Joseph realized that we are in danger, we must flee. You know, there's a lot of spiritual truth in that. Not only for what happened right then and right there, but let me tell you that there is great resistance in this world to the gospel story, and we see that even physically around the Christ child that is there. So there is so much to discuss, there is so much to share, 
And you as a mom or you as a dad can do that with your own children, with your family. The Advent readings can help with that. So, angels long to look in to the hope that God gives us. Angels long to experience this. I want you to see that there's some, there's a truth, and just notice the screen that is here. This baby was God coming to pay for the sins of all who would receive him. This Christ child was God in the flesh. This is who he was, showing us his humility, showing us his, his openness, showing us his coming in his love that we might see who he really is. That not only would he come and he would be born and live and teach, but he would die. And he would die for those who have received him. My question is, have you received him? There's, there's no greater thing that could happen at this Christmas than for you to become a Christian. There's no greater thing that could happen than for you to say, Christ was born, he lived, he died, he rose again so that I can be forgiven of my sins. My friends, come to Christ in the midst of this Christmas season and you will experience the true hope and the joy that only Christ can give. You see, this Advent Sunday, this first one, is all about the hope of the coming Messiah. A hope that is joyful, a hope that is exciting, a hope that brings God's glory to his people. May this be our worship and our celebration this year as we come to Christmas.